welcome to a special three-part edition of Cultural Caravan TV Focus on International Affairs. I'm your guest host, Rabi Nickens. Considering the current conflict between the Russian Federation and Ukraine, which is garnering global attention for the political, humanitarian, and economic implications worldwide, this Women's History Month, we thought, what better way to explore this context than by bringing you the perspectives of two phenomenal Black women of diplomacy who combined have a wealth of knowledge of the region and navigating international relations in a crisis. 40-year veteran diplomat, former U.S. ambassador to Senegal, former director of University of Central Florida's diplomacy program, and author of Diversifying Diplomacy, My Journey from Roxbury to Dakar, Ambassador Harriet Lee Elam Thomas, as well as policy expert, Ambassador Pamela L. Spratlin, whose experience includes 10 years in Central Asia, including serving as U.S. Ambassador to Kyrgyzstan, Ambassador to Uzbekistan, Country Director and Acting Deputy Assistant Secretary, Secretary for Central Asia from 2006 to 2007, and four years in Russia, including as Council General in Vladivostok from 2002 to 2004. One of our guests are no stranger to Cultural Caravan, Ambassador Harriet Lee Elam Thomas. Before we go on to our other guests today, our other esteemed guests, we want to know what have you really been up to, Ambassador, um, since we last sat down? Well, I didn't take the advice of others who tell me would tell me you're not going to retire. Uh, I can understand why they said that because once it's in your blood, it's very difficult not to continue to encourage young men and women to join the profession that gave you such joy and such a sense of comfort in terms of correcting many misperceptions that existed about the United States around the world. And I took the advice of two of my colleagues who said, Harriet, you really should seriously consider the new Center for Women, Gender and Global Leadership at Howard University, which has as its goals where, where it talks about future leaders are being prepared to be gender conscious and to be aware of the intellectual competence of black women worldwide. Am I pleased that I took their advice because my interactions with that center have been nothing but positive. And I was able to reconnect with the good Ambassador Spratton, We're not only there, but at another program, which I'll mention in a moment, in which we discussed being women of color, black women, barriers and biases for the beginning of Win Women's History Month. And I think both of us learned about each other's path and we were encouraged that we didn't let anything stop us. And it was always that family connection that made a difference in terms of who we are today. I will say that I really admire the phrase that the ambassador Spratlin uses about stepping outside of your comfort zone. Had I known that phrase or talked about that earlier with you, my students would have heard that over and over again in terms of giving them themselves the chance to look at a career that is beyond the confines of the United States. I've done book talks at various universities in Boston at MIT, my alma mater, Boston University, the Southern Illinois University at um, Syracuse University, and again, met women and men who gave me hope for the future. So it's been a very positive experience, but I can't say that I've been sitting back twiddling my thumbs since the 30th of September when I supposedly retired for the second time. Thank you for being so forthright. I, I, I knew that, that that couldn't be true, <laughs> really, really true. So thank you, thank you for being so forthright. But you know, the world was also very, very different the last time that we sat down. Um, since then, uh, you know, we, got into the midst of a global pandemic. We had a very, very different person in the White House. And of course, now we're dealing with this conflict between Russia and Ukraine. Um, what do you think since the last time we spoke, um, we've actually gotten right 
or what do you think that we need to do more to do in terms of international diplomacy as well as domestic civility? Perhaps we have none other than the sad death and murder of George Floyd to thank because that opened the eyes to the world. People were home, confined to their residences, and obviously had the 24 seven cable network news on. If not focusing on it, it was in the background. That horrendous ex- event to me crystallized what is indeed one of the deep problems of America. And that is making judgments about people based on the color of their skin. And I'm sad to say that maybe from, not sad, but maybe as our parents would say, behind every cloud, there is a silver lining. And we learned from that terrible event that there was a world out there that was suffering injustices as well, be they in Hong Kong, be they in Myanmar, be they in other places where people were treated differently because of the color of their skin or their gender. And through that, we saw a unifying force of demonstrations around the world stating that lives matter, black lives matter. And when we look at the globe, we see that the the majority of the world is made up of people of color. We often forget that living between these two oceans, divided by these two oceans. And it was a wake up call, the like of, likes of which we had not expected. And we in our business, Ambassador Spratlin knows, we talk about transnational threats. Well, pandemics know no boundaries. They don't know anything about economic stat- status. And they certainly don't care what color your skin is. So we learn again that we are totally interconnected. And that interconnectedness means we have to be far more civil with one another in the manner in which we communicate, in the manner in which we deliver messages, and in the member, manage, manner in which we receive them. So I think that out of that terrible, unpleasant experience, let us hope that our world has learned to at least begin to be more civil to one another. You would think that learning within our schools about the history of our interactions with each other would be paramount. Yet that's something that's being attacked as well. That's another big difference uh, between the last time we spoke. But actually that's a a very good segue to our other esteemed guest, uh, Ambassador Pamela L. Spratlin, uh, because we do aim to educate here at Cultural Caravan TV. And the two of you together are like, you know, hidden figures of, of phenomenal uh, diplomacy. Uh, so we would like to know a little bit more about your origins, particularly what drew you to the Foreign Service when, you know, we, we, we see that even today, a lot of people don't know about the presence of Black people within the Foreign Service. But 30 years ago, when you first came in, you would think that there would be even less representation to be seen. So what drew you to this field? Thank you very much for your question, and uh, thank you, Ravine, for this opportunity to be on this program, Cultural Caravan TV, with Ambassador Elam Thomas, who really is a giant of, of mentoring and of public diplomacy and messaging. So it's a real honor to be with both of you. Uh, I would say there was no single uh, factor that drew me into the Foreign Service, but there were a number of different seeds that were planted throughout my early life, and then on up until the time that I joined the Foreign Service in 1990. And, you know, speaking to your audience, I really hope there are some young people out there who will think about giving uh, the Foreign Service and the U.S. government abroad, because the Foreign Service is a, a wonderful place, but it's not the only place a person can serve America and be uh, abroad. But just a few of the seeds that were planted for me. I would say the first one was that I was extremely fortunate to be born to parents who themselves were people who were seekers and strivers. My mother was from Virginia, my father from Tennessee, and they were part of that 1950s wave of uh, Isabel Wilkerson's great uh, great migration or that she talked about in The Warmth of Other Sons, which is a wonderful book I hope everyone has read. And uh, they were seeking opportunity. They found the South stultifying and they wanted to get away. So my father um, was able to go to both uh, high school and college 
in Ohio. Then he went uh, away to the Korean War, and that was also a broadening experience for him. And at that time, when you got your PhD at a Big Ten school in, uh, in um, the mid-50s, you were expected to go to an HBCU, the wonderful HBCU system, and then uh, start your pro professorial career there. My father made a decision that he wanted to have more opportunities. To, so he decided to get out of his comfort zone. He and my mother packed us all up and we moved to Washington State. Um, and there we were just 35 miles south of the Canadian border in a small teacher's college. And that's where I spent my early childhood. So one influence was my parents and their own wanderlust for opportunity. The second was I, even though I was in an all white school in, in the situation that, that I was in along with my, my sisters, um, we had this wonderful French teacher and I had already been curious about languages from some of the children's books that I had, but she was a larger than life person who actually exemplified the idea that you could go anywhere, you could say anything in a, any language that you could learn and that you could be anything. And so that was an incredibly inspiring example to have. Um, and then later on, I had, uh, I, I, when I was in college, I learned about the foreign service, but I was a little intimidated, actually quite a lot intimidated. And so I didn't wanna take the foreign service exam. I tried to join the Peace Corps, but that didn't end up working out for me, but I never lost my taste for wanting to somehow work abroad on behalf of the United States. So I went, I knew I wanted to be in public service. I went and worked in public service, but there came a moment when I needed to change. And so I took the foreign service exam and I was very much helped by a friend of mine whose brother was a foreign service officer. And even as I went through this terrible maze that was the process of getting into the foreign service, she was always there to encourage me. And ultimately I did meet her brother who was the first foreign service officer that I met. So all of those many um, experiences and others, Ravine, were the things that helped plant seeds in me to join the foreign service and to take that step of going out of the comfort zone in order to pursue a dream and find an opportunity. Uh, Ambassador Elam Thomas, what about you? Greece, Turkey, uh, we know also Dakar, Senegal, but again, some places where you may or may not necessarily expect African-Americans to gravitate towards. Well, as my colleague just mentioned about stepping out of comfort zone, as I, I mentioned too earlier, that resonated with me. We have just seen, and I'm going to tell your audience members, a film entitled The American Diplomat, which highlights the careers of three trailblazers, two of whom were political appointees, and one was a career ambassador. The careerist, Ambassador Terrence Todman, was one of my mentors. And he would tell us, do not wear your gender or your race as a chip on your shoulder, make yourself known to other geographic areas, which is perhaps, not perhaps, it is probably why I ended up in Greece and Turkey, because this was so far from what the norm. I was working as a career counselor in personnel at the U.S. Information Agency, and I was intrigued by the culture and something, I lived near a Greek church in Washington and I, I was fascinated with the food. And like Pamela, I had a French teacher who I fell in love with when I was 13. She was not African-American, but that increased my desire to go away from the United States. My family thought I joined the Foreign Legion, truly. Now I'm a generation older than my colleague. So you can imagine my father thinks I'm going off to fight the French or do whatever. In any case, I learned that if you speak the language of another person, they automatically realize that you respect them, you respect their culture, and you do honor to them as a whole being. And as Nelson Mandela says, if you speak to a person in the language he or she knows, you speak to their head. But if you speak to them in their own language, you speak to their heart. And I believe that is so true. And I've watched my interactions with others and I've watched others interact with Americans 
who may not know more than the greetings, the amenities, hello, how are you? But that stress and strain all of, it, all of a sudden diminishes and people feel comfortable in engaging with you. Well, that's the first step in credible diplomacy. So I did go to Greece after a few challenges because uh, the story is much too long. As the stars were in alignment, the person who went to be the cultural attache didn't stay, and I was asked to go the set to, to, to take his place. The ambassador I had worked for in the Ivory Coast invited me to have dinner at his home, and I saw all of these signs and posters around and what I thought were hieroglyphics. Well, they were the Cyrillic alphabet. And I said, Mr. Ambassador, thank you very much. Uh, well, your French is fluent, I said, but I can't even read this. This could well be somewhere from a tomb in Egypt somewhere. And he just chuck chuckled. I ended up going to Greece, passing the exam and having a little too much press so that I didn't get promoted for four years. There are ups and downs to these things. Um, but I also met an economic officer in Greece or in Turkey when I was desk officer for Greece, Turkey and Cyprus who was fluent in Turkish. And I said, he's older than I, and if he could do it, I can. So I learned Greek at 42, Turkish at 47. So when one talks about what happened in your career, when I would give speeches to older adults and mid-level level careerists, don't say you're too old to learn something because I managed to do that. I met Nelson Mandela three weeks before my Turkish exam. I'll be very honest with you, I wasn't sure I could pass it. He addressed a joint session of Congress and I managed to sit next to Judge Leon Higginbottom and his wife and sat mesmerized and said he has no bitterness. If he can do this, I can pass that Turkish exam. And that was my inspiration. So it is true that the languages make all the difference in the world but you also need to be sensitive to the culture and listen as you, as you live and inhabit in that new world. Wow, it just seems like listening to the two of you, you were actually really fortunate to, to have role models uh, in your lives, in your personal lives, and even in your professional lives, yet we still have heard this term that uh, the State Department is still pale, male, and Yale, you know? So how can that be? What, what exactly would be what you would say is the state of diversity, particularly when it comes to Black people, people of African descent now, given all that you've accomplished and uh, people like uh, Terrence uh, Todman, Carl Rowan, uh, Edward Dudley, Patricia Roberts Harris, we've had all of the, Condoleezza Rice, we've had, you know, we've had so many different people in these positions and yet we also still hear about a lack of diversity. So two part question, what would you say is the state of diversity, particularly when it comes to black people in the foreign service and what exactly is being done about it by yourselves and the different organizations that you're part of or in terms of other types of initiatives, whether uh, based on public or private partnerships? The existence of the Terrence Todmans is rare but the existence of the Carl Rowans and Edward Dudleys is not so rare. The Condoleezza Rices, the Susan Rices, they were political appointees. They are not career diplomats and not to denigrate their incredible intellect and expertise in the various fields. Very few secretaries of state, we've only had one and that was Larry Eagerberger. Is that not correct? Who was a career diplomat who became secretary of state. So there is that distinction that we must keep in mind. And there are fewer in the pipeline who are female or minorities to move up to, the, to become ambassadors. It usually takes about 25 years. And nowadays, young men and women as bright and talented as they are, have so many other options out there that after three to five years, Google or someone else in the private sector will take them under their wing, pay them three times as much, and they can live abroad, and they can have an overseas experience. 
but it's not the same as public service. Now, there, that's the distinct difference. And so we don't see the representation we'd like to see. And it's an uphill battle. It's a work in progress. We now have an ambassador who is the chief diversity, equity, and inclusion officer who reports directly to the Secretary of State. And I'm pleased to say that the current Secretary of State insisted that that be the case when he initiated that position. He also met with the Thursday Luncheon Group, which is the group of Black American foreign and civil service officers, the Blacks in government and the Black professionals in international affairs on March 1st, in the beginning of the crisis in Ukraine and spent 57 minutes with senior leadership discussing the issues that are at hand. Now, both Ambassador Spratlin and I feel we've heard that story before that yes, we have instituted new rulings, new, new procedures, but it's going to take more than my administration as Secretary of State to really change it. He's correct, but we've, we've, we've been down that road before. We are hopeful that with a chief diversity and inclusion officer who, whose position is to not only follow the data, but disaggregate that data so, data so that you know what it really meant, means when you say there are X number of women, X number of Blacks, X number of Latinos. What does it really mean? Where are they assigned? So I'm somewhat encouraged but I still say that it is a work in progress because the majority of the foreign service officers in my generation were white, pale, male, and Yale. Well, I uh, really appreciate what Ambassador Elam Thomas uh, has said. The only thing, I would just add a couple of points. Uh, number one, on the ecosystem of the State Department itself. It's an institution that was always there to defend certain interests, right? And those were the interests of the people who uh, were defining the direction that America would take. And we were as far out of that as you could possibly be, um, even when uh, Sally Hemings went to Paris with Thomas Jefferson, you know, she, was, she went in with a certain kind of status. And so it's been an uphill battle ever since then punctuated by certain people who wanted there to be opportunity. And we can even go back to the 19th century when, um, when President Grant made uh, a decision that we should have black representation in Haiti. You know, we know that Frederick Douglass was in Haiti when President McKinley sent a man named Richard Greener to Vladivostok, Russia, where I later served. But the overall ecosystem was still not hospitable to us. In addition to the ecosystem uh, having a particular perception of itself and working for the interests of a particular group of people, now we also have the interesting challenge, and, and, and it is a challenge, even though I think it also is filled with opportunities, of the fact that diversity itself is changing. Um, at the time that I came into the Foreign Service, and perhaps when Ambassador Elam Thomas came into the service, diversity meant black and white. We're going to go from um, a, a foreign service that is all white to one that has some black people in it. Foreign Service Act of 1980 comes along and says, we are going to have a foreign service that looks like America. What does that mean? It means that diversity blossoms and it starts to mean not just black, it means also Hispanic, it means Asian, it means LGBTQ, it means people with disabilities, it means women. And so be, when you have this explosion of the meaning of diversity, that means that our part of it as black people becomes that much more challenging. All the while you have this up and out pyramid system that makes it harder and harder to move up. And so what we see now is a foreign service and a state department that I think is doing a better job at the lower ranks of bringing people in uh, whether they are coming in as civil service, uh, serv civil servants, contractors, foreign service officers, but they reach a mid-level and that's where we begin to see the filtering that disadvantages us. And by the time people get to the senior foreign service, which is the group from which the ambassadors are taken from, um, uh, from which the ambassadors are taken, that's where it starts to look a lot more like the foreign service of old. 
that included no women, that included no black people, that had no diversity. And that is the challenge, I think, of the next generation of trying to build our pipelines and networks to allow this diversity to flow upward, even as we have this highly competitive system that will only let a few of the people into these plum positions, including those of ambassador. So we have a long way to go. I would say having a chief diversity and inclusion officers is a good first step. Um, having a secretary of state who has made uh, a commitment to this as several of his colleagues in the past have. But what we need to see are concrete results. And I would say that the, the core of this for being really is not only the rules and the symbolic things that are happening, like the recently the um, naming of the cafeteria in the State Department after Ambassador Todman, because when he first started as a career ambassador, as a career diplomat, he couldn't even eat in the cafeteria. That's how closed the State Department was to us. And so now next week, there will be a plaque put up and there was a, a, a ceremony before. But what's happening, I think, is that those relationships between individuals and their supervisors, that's what makes a career. You heard Ambassador Elam Thomas talk about it in terms of how she got to Greece. Those relationships have everything to do with our own biases, what's inside of us, our own willingness to accept a world that is broader. And so we still have a lot of work to do. And um, some things facilitate it, some things make it more difficult. Uh, but again, decision makers and leadership are terribly important as are pressure groups like the American Black Ambassadors Association and others. And I would say we're being you. Journalists are also important to help people understand what is the Foreign Service and to keep raising these kinds of issues so that people hear about it. Um, it's going to take a lot of efforts in many different areas in order for us to keep fighting for a Foreign Service that is what the law says it should be, a Foreign Service that looks like America. We are gonna come back for a part two with these phenomenal ladies of diplomacy, where we're going to talk a little bit more in our next episode about their impact on the places that they've been. Uh, what are some of the advantages of being black and a woman in these different spaces? And particularly, what should we know about the black presence in an area that is now a hot topic Russia. Stay, stay tuned. If you want to find out a bit more, you're only going to see this uh, powerhouse pair on Cultural Caravan TV. So see you next time. Mm -hmm.